this lesson, we're going to look a little bit more in depth at some properties of exponential functions. We're going to look at their graphs and figure out things like, what are the domain and range of exponential functions? Do they have any x or y intercepts? What are their intervals of increase or decrease? And what does that even mean? And do they have any asymptotes or not? We're also going to use Desmos to help us illustrate some of these key properties of exponential functions. To start though, we need to have a quick discussion about what the parent function is for exponential functions. We've seen the general formula for exponential functions written as y equals a times b to the exponent x, where a is just our initial value and b is our rate of increase or rate of growth. But this version of our equation doesn't have any numbers in there for a or b. So what exactly does the parent function look like? Well for exponential functions there actually are limitless numbers of parent functions. It all depends on what your rate of growth or rate of decay is. If we're using a rate of growth that is doubling our parent function is going to look like y equals 2 to the exponent x. This means that our rate of growth is going to be 2, and our initial value is actually 1. Notice how there's no value in front of this 2. We just have a b value. The a value will be 1. If we wanted to model after a function that was tripling, then our parent function will change. It would instead be y equals 3 to the x. Maybe we want to have a parent function which models a half-life question. Well, a half-life question will have a rate of growth or a rate of decay of one-half, so the equation would be y equals one-half to the x. Notice how there's unlimited number of parent functions that we can create for an exponential. So for any example we're going to look at, we need to first figure out what is the parent function, and then we can apply any transformations that we notice. Our first example looks at this equation, y equals 4 times 1 half to the exponent x. What is the parent function for this exponential equation? Well, we can see that there is an a value here of 4 and a b value here of 1 half. Our parent function is going to use that b value. So you probably guessed it, but our parent function is y equals one-half to the exponent x. This is sort of like a half-life question. That 4 out front represents our initial value. So if we were to draw a sketch of what this would look like, our first dot on the graph should be at a y value of 4, when x equals 0. Remember, the initial value happens when x is at 0, or we're at time 0. So this is the point 0, 4. Next, we can get more points by realizing what our rate of growth or rate of decay is. Because we have a rate of decay of 1 half, then we will be going down by half for every value of x that we increase. So when x equals 1, our y value should decrease down to 2. And when x equals 2, our y value should decrease in half again to 1. And so on and so forth. We can keep going down by half and down by half. Let's take a quick look at what this function looks like on Desmos. Let's begin by looking at our parent function y equals one half to the exponent x. We can see that this curve starts really high on the left and then decreases down to the right. We can also see our initial value here at 1. This is common for a parent function where the initial value will start at 1. But depending on whether we have a rate of increase or a rate of decrease, or whether we have exponential growth or exponential decay, that will determine in which direction the curve goes. Well now let's plot the equation that we were given. y equals 4 times 1 half to the exponent x. This has the same look as our other curve, 
except we have an initial value here at 4 rather than at 1. You may also notice that this appears a bit steeper than our parent function. That's because if we think about what this 4 actually represents when we talk about transformations, it could mean a vertical stretch of 4. Something that's more stretched out is going to look more narrow. We can look at some other key points on here too, and just like our sketch, we have a value of 2 when x is 1, and we have a value of 1 when x is 2, and I'm sure when x is 3 we'd have a value of 1 half. But also notice that the curve goes to the left as well. If x equaled negative 1, we would do the opposite effect to get to it. Instead of dividing it in half, we're now going to multiply by 2. So we actually end up with a value of 8. And if we scroll a little bit higher up, when x is negative 2, well, there it is. y is a value of 16. This is what our curve looks like zoomed out. If we were to describe the domain of this function, domain representing x values, we can see that the x values will continue forever in the left and the right direction. We can see that to the left this curve just shoots up into the air, but the x values will always decrease further negative, so this will continue forever. Moving towards the right when x increases, we end up with really small y values but the x values do continue on forever. So our domain here is xer, or all values of x are element, elements of the real number system. What about our range? Well, one thing that we can see is that the y values will continue up and onwards forever. But when we reach the bottom of our graph, notice how there's no y values that go into the negatives there is a limit to what these y values can be. And in fact, we have an asymptote that happens right along the x-axis. The more we zoom in, the more that we can see that this curve will never cross the x-axis. Because there's an asymptote there, we would have to say that the y values are strictly greater than zero. So our range is y e r such that y has to be greater than zero, but not equal to because of the asymptote. Speaking of asymptotes, let's just throw on the equation for that asymptote. Since we know the asymptote is the x-axis, that equation is y equals zero. So let's put a line on there to signify that asymptote. And that's the equation. One new property we're going to talk about with exponential functions is their intervals of increase or decrease. To describe this red curve, we would say that this curve is decreasing from left to right. But another part of the property that we need to add in is whether it's decreasing faster or slower as we move from left to right. You can see that the left part of this graph is much steeper than the right part of this graph. And as we continue to the right, we get less and less steep. And it actually levels off towards the end. So although we're decreasing, we're decreasing at a decreasing rate. Finally, we can just talk about what the intercepts are. And these are pretty easy to see. We can see that there's a y-intercept here at 4. And because there's an asymptote at y equals 0, or along the x-axis, there won't be any x-intercepts. So, to quickly recap, the domain of this function is simply x, e, r. And the range of this function was y, e, r, such that y had to be strictly greater than 0, because of that asymptote. We said there was only one intercept, and that was a y-intercept at, at 0, 4. We said that the interval of increase or decrease was decreasing, but also at a decreasing rate. 
And finally, the asymptote equation is y equals 0. Let's check out the second example. Here we have the equation y equals negative 3 to the exponent negative x. Just like last time, let's figure out what our parent function is to begin. We're going to look at the b value in the equation, and don't be fooled. Even though there's a negative here, that negative is not part of the b value. Remember, the b value can't ever be negative. So our b value here is simply 3, which makes our parent function y equals 3 to the x. Or it's an exponential function that is tripling. Based on what we know about transformations, a negative in front means that this is going to be a reflection over the x-axis. Something you may not have realized is a negative that's in front of the x is another reflection, in this case a reflection over the y-axis. It's like we're taking the it's like we're taking the parent function and just flip-flopping it around everywhere. Let's start by sketching where our first initial point would be. And because there's no a value, our initial value has to be at 1. The next value will triple, so when x equals 1, our next point should be at y value of 3. And then when x equals 2, our next point should be at a y value of of 9. If we go in reverse, we're going to need to take a third of whatever the initial value was. So when x is negative 1, we'll actually have a point here at 1 third. And then we're going to get ever so close to the x-axis, just like we did before. And you'll start to see that, again, there's going to be an asymptote there. Let's use Desmos again to quickly see what this equation looks like when graphed. So here is our parent function, y equals 3 to the x. Now let's take a look at what happens to the graph if we put a negative in front of the 3x, or just like we had thought, a reflection over the x-axis. We can see that this curve pretty much is a mirror image over the x-axis. And in fact, it now has its initial value at negative 1. That's interesting. What would have happened if instead of doing the negative in front of the 3, we just put the negative in front of the x? What would that look like? Well, again, just like we initially thought, this is a reflection over the y-axis. It's a mirror image. And it does have its initial value still at 1. But now this is a decreasing function. Okay, so if this orange curve is what our curve looks like if it's reflected over the x-axis, and the black curve is what the curve looks like if we're reflected over the y-axis, what do you think it's going to look like when we put it all together? There it is. This red curve is our equation that's been reflected in both the x and y axis. And again, we can see our initial value here happens to be negative 1. The domain of this function, just like before, is x e r. This function will continue forever both in the left and right directions. But the range of this function, we can see it hits an asymptote again at the x axis, but this time from below. So all the y values that could exist have to be below the x-axis, or below 0. So our range is y e r such that y has to be strictly less than 0. We do have a y-intercept at negative 1, and again, no x-intercepts because of the asymptote. The equation of that asymptote, y equals 0. And finally, what is the rate of increase or decrease? Well, from left to right, our values are increasing. Even though we're below the x-axis, the values are increasing as we go from left to right. But are they increasing faster or slower as we go? Well, you can see that the graph becomes less steep as we go from left to right, which means we're slowing down our rate of increase. 
So we would describe this as increasing, but at a decreasing rate. Here's that summary one more time. We said that it has a domain of XER and that its range has to be strictly less than zero. So YER such that Y has to be strictly less than zero. We again only had a Y intercept, but in this case at negative one, and our interval of increase or decrease was that we were increasing, but at a decreasing rate. Finally, our asymptote again along the x-axis, so it had an equation of y equals zero. And there we have some key properties of exponential functions. When you're asked to describe some of the properties of exponential functions, remember, there are limitless numbers of parent functions. You just need to figure out what is the b value, or the rate of increase, or decrease. And when trying to figure out what the interval of increase or decrease is, always read from left to right. So from left to right, are the y values getting bigger or are the y values getting smaller? Are we increasing or decreasing? And at what rate? Faster or slower? There should also always be an asymptote somewhere. And it may not necessarily stay at the x-axis because maybe our graph has been transformed up or down. But we'll get more into that in a later lesson. Oh, <laughs>